Um, hey everybody, I'm uh, Preeti. I'll be talking about AI in the human loop today. So this is who I am. I'll keep it brief. I've been working at the intersection of AI and SecOps specifically, um, mostly focusing on analyst augmentation or automation in security operations and outside of work. I love you know talking about board games, psychology, human factors. And today I'll be talking about a recent research project of mine. And feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I don't use X or Twitter that often, so LinkedIn is the best way. Uh, so quick show of hands. I know everybody's happy hour, but I'd still like to know my audience. Uh, how many of you here work in uh, SecOps, DNR? OK. And how many of you here consider yourselves to be like data scientists, machine learning engineers, statisticians? OK, wonderful. And how many of you here have done LLM app dev going beyond the basic chatbot prompting? Oh, yeah, that's a good, good number of folks. Excellent. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback um, about how you've been measuring the productivity of some of the um, LLM apps that you've been using. So the goal for today, or my research project, is how do LLM-based applications perform in a SOC that handles millions of alerts across customers? And I'm using the word LLM specifically and not generative AI because I wanted to focus specifically on the large language models, not necessarily the generative AI applications, which can include a bunch of other things. So before I started my research project, one of the first things that I wanted to do was figure out what is the lay of the land, right? Um, what's in front of me? And some of my awesome colleagues have done really interesting work. Um, the team at Sophos has done um, good work in terms of benchmarking the security capabilities of large language models. Uh, they've evaluated a bunch like converting text to SQL, summarizations, and their takeaway was most models only had about 50% accuracy. Like if you look at that graph there, it's about like 50% accuracy. And they've benchmarked a bunch of different um, LLMs. And the drawback, at least according to me, was that a lot of this was not implemented or measured with an analyst workflow. And then at that point, those were the best metrics available. Of course, this field is exploding, and every day new metrics and met measurements come about. And this is um, some of the results from um, Microsoft's uh, random control, uh, randomized control trial of security for, uh, of Copilot for security. And their takeaways were professionals were um, less accurate in doing some report-based tasks and incident response tasks, uh, incident response tasks, and professionals were also slower in some of, some of the aspects. Whereas novices or people who are newer to the industry and newer to the SOC um, were able to perform some of these tasks in a much better way. The thing that they did, at least per my understanding of their research paper, is um, they had two specific incidents that they conducted that they provided as part of the randomized control trial. And all of the incidents were very um, defender native. So I wanted to go a little beyond that, push the envelope, uh, because this is great research. And I wanted to take that one step further. And what I did was this, challenge accepted. Let's try to put large language models directly in an analyst workflow. And let's also use alerts or incidents and investigations across different data sources, different tooling, not just limited to a couple of tools. And this also had to happen within the S uh, existing SLA constraints that most security analysts operate under. Just a quick overview. The first task here um, as part of my research project is like, how do we generate key findings? A lot of people call this as incident report writing. And um, in our case, we're doing this, like, on average, we have about like 200 to 300 incidents. And then there are like red team incidents. We provide constant updates. So is there anything here that we can use um, LLMs for? And one of the reasons we chose this, it's, it is a complex task. But one of the reasons we chose this was because there is a lot of natural language involved in it, which is the strength of the LLM, um, and not necessarily for doing a lot of pure reasoning-based tasks, which also comes under the LLM systems, but they're more like reinforcement learning-based systems. So this is one of our um, tasks or use cases that we are testing out. And then the next one is, can we orient an analyst who is 
dropped into a response environment with everything that is present in form of alerts and vendor data. Um, is that something that we can do? Um, the idea here was to kind of look at um, the reasoning and find out if there are like outcomes that we can come up with that an analyst can orient themselves. All right, so without beating, uh, beating around the bush too much, um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is just this high level boxes, right? Like this was the LLM powered application. The goal of this talk is to not tell you how to like develop an LLM powered application, but mostly to tell you about what factors to consider and how to design experiments to see if they truly provide the value and ROI that you need in your environment. Um, so quickly here, it is depending on, you know, the the kind of use case that we're using. We provide a bunch of alerts enrichment along with it. And then in some cases, we'll have like potential remediation actions, which is after an investigation is conducted. Um, and we'll documentize all of this, send it to an LLM model. There are configurations such as prompt templates. There are configurations like other hyperparameters like um, the uh, temperature values. So those are all configurations. And then finally, we document the metrics offline. And then the output comes around. But where do we put the human in this? One of the key aspects of our, or one of the key goals of our experiment was to actually put this in the, um, in the hands of our analyst and in an automated way without having them to like iterate on prompts continuously without having like a chatbot-like situation. Because the novelty of a chatbot will fade very soon, especially when you're in active response mode. So, Data teams are always like, show me the data. We want more data. And in my experience working at this intersection of security and um, ML, the security teams are almost like, show me the results, and then I can tell you whether things are good or not. So it's always a tricky balance. We want to introduce as minimum friction as possible while collecting meaningful data. Um, so this was the key part of, um, of our, our research, like trying to figure out how to uh, best set up some of these experiments. I think some of the talks earlier this morning, especially around the large scale phishing attack, uh, kind of um, alluded to experiment design. Uh, it only presented the results, but I can go deeper into the experiment design. So human in the loop is a common term where we talk about a collaborative approach where the humans are, um, where the humans are teaching machine learning models and training, but wouldn't, like the real outcome we, we want is we want AI in the loop where AI is producing outputs and the humans are at the center of decision making. So instead of doing a human in the loop, we really want AI in the loop. And this is one of the key aspects here. We want the AI system to kind of produce outputs from the get go. Right, so the first approach for either of our experiments was we wanted to measure time. Um, what does it look like you know, when a single analyst is given a workflow with and without LLMs? So that was our first approach. But if you really think about it, there is bias in, introduced here because the same analyst will be looking at the same incident and then there's a lot of duplicative effort. This is definitely not acceptable. The second approach is can we give a few analysts um, like no LLMs and then another anal and a bunch of other analysts, a few LLMs. This is the classic um, control versus test experiment setup. However, the question that came about here was, what if a few of these analysts are more experienced? What if some of these analysts are not that experienced? And will that affect the lift? Will that affect the outcome of our experiments? So these were the challenges. And in addition to that, we wanted to provide a different combination of like models and get different types of feedback. So if people have seen Chatbot Arena, that's exactly what Chatbot Arena does. Um, they have a bunch of uh, different types of models, but they don't tell you what the actual model is until you type and get an answer. So my question, my prompt here was, is hot dog a sandwich? And then you can rate saying one was better, the other one was not so good, tie. We really thought about this. Does this really suffice in our condition? Probably not. Just getting thumbs up and thumbs down does not add a lot of meaningful information in terms of what we can leverage and confidently say, yes, this particular piece of information generated by the LLM was good, and 
something was not good. So this did not really cut, cut it for us. Um, so we wanted to look at more automated ways of doing this. And that's when we, we set up an A-B uh, AB test experiment bed. So there are three different types of variants. The first variant is obviously we want to run two different experiments, the key findings generation and orienting an analyst as soon as they're dropped into this environment. And the third variant is for every experiment, we want to check how junior analysts are performing, how se senior analysts are performing. And finally, for every group of analysts, we also wanted to check um, how different models are performing and um, different parameters and configurations, templates, you know, all the hyperparameters that go with us. So this is the A-B test um, experiment setup um, that, that, we pro that we did. Um, and finally, uh, the success of every experiment depends on the integrity of how well the experiment is run. One of the constraints or challenges that we had was that our analysts are very collaborative in nature. So the senior and the junior analysts kind of work together, which meant we cannot actually do an A-B test, but we had to come up with something called as like a switchback test. Not necessarily come up, it is fairly standard, but a switchback test is basically running the experiment um, randomly, it's still random, but we switch back and forth across different time periods. Um, so that way, even if there are network effects, uh, the impact of those effects are not very um, persistent in the results of our experiments. So this is our experiment design. We did a switchback test experiment. And then finally, this is like our Gen LLM generated output. So yes, the experiment is, uh, the A-B test is producing results. And now finally, we wanted to measure. Um, so what did we want to measure? We wanted to measure things like <clears throat> time to edit, the quality uh, across both the use cases that we had. And when it comes to measurements, we're also doing automated measurements. So here's an example where we provide some sort of um, input, which is what we provide uh, as the input to the LLM, and then we have the LLM generated output. So an example here is, in order to measure hallucination, um, the truth is whatever we compute from the investigation, and the claims is whatever we compute from the LLM generated output. So the, if the truth, like let's say we ask a question, was a domain controller involved in this particular incident? And if the truth says, I don't know, and if the claim was that yeah, yes, then that becomes a hallucination because the model is creating something that we're not very sure of. It's an I don't know. And contradiction is when it clearly violates. Um, so the truth says the answer is no. Uh, so the truth says the answer is yes, and the claim says the answer is no. So there's a clear contradiction. And then finally, coverage is a key metric. Um, let's say we ask the question, was a web shell deployed? And the truth says yes. The claim also says yes. That means the LLM is picking out the right relevant context from whatever we're providing as the input. So this is um, one such aspect. And then this, I mean, the previous one is something that's fairly industry standard. We call it question and answer generation and evaluation. But this is um, a different aspect, which is what if we can identify signal gaps? So let's say we have a reference document and the reference document is something where our analysts reflect on and provide their thoughts. And they say, we found a particular vulnerability and the analyst writes it up. But it's not necessarily in our LLM input at all. And that is a critical gap that we find in our data strategy. So one of the serendipitous outcomes of our experiments was to identify potential data gaps. This is just an example that kind of walks you through that. So the ones marked in green are things that were correctly identified. This is the reference. And the one on the right is the LLM generator output. It does create a lot of hallucinations and incorrect uh, data. And then the one marked in the red box, that is the one that the analyst or the human provided as an input. And that is their reflection on the data, uh, which was something that the LLM could not get because it was not present in the data in the first place. And these help us really answer questions such as what is good um, data strategy, what is not so good, 
should we focus on improving our modeling techniques, prompting techniques, or should we focus on improving things that are going in as signals? So that is um, a critical uh, piece of outcome from our experiment. And then in terms of results, uh, cost was uh, something that definitely everybody considers. Uh, cost was very easy for us to compute because uh, initially everybody is like, you know, wanting to get uh, people onto their platform. So cost was definitely an easy factor here. To, and cost of generating an incident was very low compared to the actual ones. But the key results here are quality and time go hand in hand, better quality, less edit times, less time to write. In case of Palm and Gemini, you know, the AI in the loop was beneficial. The LLM was able to write good things. But in the case of a tuned model, which was surprising, the model learned some aspects and forgot all its inherent learned capabilities. So in this case, it was counterproductive. And another thing that was, which was surprising was initially we were concerned about alignment, that is hallucinations. Um, but hallucinations were not that much of a problem, whereas coverage was a problem. The model failed to retain a lot of the things that was actually provided in the form of input. So I think these were the two things that we learned so far. And One sorry, Why that happens sometimes during the tuning where when you're training some of the end layers of a large language model, some of the inherent tasks. Possible, possible. Is, well, is that what yes, that could be one of the aspects here. Um, I know I have to finish the talk, so yeah, yeah. And finally, this is our path forward. We want to like do more analysis over different types of models, threat types, because this is not well covered or researched, and uh, we want to amplify the analyst, analyst provided signals. So that's pretty much it. These are the things that you need to ask as a data scientist. You know, do we need yes or no tasks? I think that is a better takeaway. Instead of doing more complex tasks, can we simply do intent classification? And then as a security practitioner, I think we should definitely ask questions as how much of an impact will this have on our workflow? What will change? What kind of feedback do I have to provide? Um, I think these are things that we have to consider. So that's it for me.